OK. Here we go. So conclusions, yippee. OK, so this course, I've only covered, you know, it's a nice introduction to intelligent systems and machine learning. I, th I think the, with the, the topics that I chose, it gives you a nice introduction to what is currently seen in the industry, but there's still a lot more to cover. There's what I've done so far in this course barely scratches the surface. What is seen in industry is actually a little different than what you've seen here. So even, you know, I've only covered like a, a small set of topics and even in this small subset, there are some topics that I glossed over, like Bayesian decision theory, there's a huge research following of that, or support vector machines, I didn't cover enough theory on that. So there's all these, all these areas that I've covered where I've only scratched the surface and you can certainly get into that in more details. But um, even in the small subset, we covered the following topics. So there's supervised learning, there's regression, we did linear regression, univariate and multivariate. We did uh, cost function optimization, so there's gradient descent, there's feature scaling, there's gradient descent for large data sets, stochastic gradient descent, and regularization. And then we cover uh, classification, you know, binary and multi-class, decision boundaries, there's Bayesian decision theory, which we didn't really cover as much, but I gave you enough to get started. Uh, neural networks, huge, huge currently in the industry, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, in terms of what the industry is currently doing and support vector machines. Uh, we also talked about how to design machine learning systems, how to analyze and see whether or not they're performing well, such as bias and variance. Uh, we talked about learning curves, whether or not your system is performing well. We talked about cross-validation data sets. And we also talked about uh, skewed data evaluation. So we took a look at precision recall and F1 score. And then finally, we took a look at unsupervised learning. So we took a look at k-means, we took a look at self-organizing maps, we also took a look at dimensionality reduction. It's, it's a pretty fun lab if you take a look at it, k-means and dimensionality reduction, the last lab. We took a look at uh, principal components analysis as a facilitation for doing dimensionality reduction and finally singular value decomposition to do the actual work. And then finally, we ended the course with evolutionary computing. So we took a look at genetic algorithms, and then we took a look at swarm intelligence, particle swarm optimization, as well as ant calling optimization to start off. Okay, so these topics are what I felt were the best introduction to machine learning intelligence systems. So if you actually wanted to pursue a career or maybe pursue graduate studies in this particular area, then I think I've given you enough to get started. You obviously will have to do a little more reading than what, you, than what, I've, you know, than what you've done in this course. So there are also many, many more topics to explore, which this course should give you the right introduction to. If I were to, if I, personally, if I were to offer a second machine learning course, this, these would be the topics that I would consider covering, and these are currently hot topics in the industry right now. One of the topics that we didn't cover, which I find really fascinating, are what are known as recommender systems. Recommender systems are basically, you, let's say you're watching Netflix or you're on some sort of product website, whether it's eBay or something that you want to buy, and basically given your search history and given other people's search history that are similar to yours, it'll recommend you products that they think that you might enjoy. So a good, you know, so a good example would be Netflix. If you ever watch Netflix and you look through, if you, you know, watch a bunch of movies, at the end of the movie, they're going to give you certain suggestions. Maybe you'll like to watch this movie, or maybe you'll like to watch this other movie. And what they do is that they take a look at your history of movies and compare it to movies that other people have seen that follow a similar trend to you. And based on the, that data, they create a predictive model that will predict, with, you know, predict which movies that you would most likely give with a high rating. Okay, so it recommends movies that are similar to what you watched, and it's a very large machine learning problem because you have to accurately predict ratings for a movie that the user hasn't seen based on their current trend of movies as well as other movies that other people have seen. So it's, the goal is to predict with high probability that if you were to theoretically watch this movie, you would give it a very high rating, and that is the movie that would be recommended to you. So it's actually a very large machine learning problem. Actually, um, there was a competition on Kaggle, which is a data science platform that was known as the, uh, the Netflix competition. They offered what's known as the Netflix prize, which is basically, it's a million dollar prize where they would offer any data science or machine learning team to improve their recommendation engine. If you were able to improve their recommendation engine by any margin, or if you can do better than they could, they would actually give you a million bucks. And actually, it was won by a team of seven. And uh, you, can, you can read up on Incagable more details, and I can give you uh, information about it on the website, but it has been won. And you know, it's what's known as the Netflix Prize. So the next topic would be decision trees and decision tree learning. So machine learning, it's a machine learning technique that performs prediction by taking a look at certain rules that you enforce on features. It's, what's our, it's what are known as uh, classification and regression trees, or CART. So a good example would be you have, basically, if you ever used decision trees before, you can think of it as kind of like a flow chart. You start from the root, and then based on features of the input, you make certain decisions based on what the features look like. So for example, this would be a decision tree 
for Titanic survivors. So for example, you start at the very top, and then you take a look at the gender. Is the gender of that person male? If it's yes, you go down one route. If it's no, you go down another. So then let's say it's yes. And then if you take a look, if it's yes, is their age greater than nine and a half? If it is, then unfortunately they've died with a probability of you know, 0.17. And if they, if it's, you know, if it's, sorry, if it's less than 9.5, they're dead. If it's greater, then you go down this tree. Then what you do is you're, you're basically using a bunch of tests or rules based on your features to figure out what exactly you want to classify each input as. And once you reach the end of the root, it'll give you a particular label or a particular value that you use to infer the actual final thing at the end. So, it, so what this is doing here is that you know, you're, you're predicting whether or not something, you know, whether or not a passenger has died or survived with a certain probability, and you're using age, gender, and the number of you know, siblings or spouses on board for that particular passenger at the time before it crashed. So there's one, there's one particular example. So carts have been used uh, in a variety of different applications, such as medicine, control systems, physics simulations, uh, object recognition, and so on. The hardest part is to actually create the actual tree that will with high accuracy perform those classifications for you. That's the hardest step. Traversing the tree is actually pretty easy. And uh, the next topic is one of my favorites. It's what are known as deep neural networks. So the buzzword that you hear constantly in, in the industry is what is known as deep learning. So what deep neural networks are is they're basically neural networks that are specifically designed for high dimensional data. So uh, high resolution images or high dimensional data sets. And there are many, many, many layers of hidden neurons with many, ma sorry, many, many, many hidden layers with many, many, many hidden neurons per layer. So they're what's one, what are known as deep neural networks because you have a whole bunch, you have, you have lots and lots of neurons and lots and lots of layers, okay? So in this course, we assume that only one hidden layer is suitable and anything beyond one layer would be you know, harder to train, but that's been disproved. It's not true anymore because of the recent advances in computers and you know, GPUs and all that. So they're actually quite easy to train uh, when you consider a neural network with a lot of layers. One of the best known deep neural network applications are what are known as a convolutional neural network, okay? So convolutional neural networks, if you plan to go into any image processing or computer vision field, if you want to specifically focus on computer vision, then convolutional neural networks are the latest craze in order to make the most best applications. So some examples of convolutional neural networks seen in practice are perhaps if you take a look at uh, hand, written digits. So on Google Street View, they take a look at pictures on the roads, and then there are certain digits that are very hard to classify. So they use convolutional neural networks that recognize these you know, very hard digits. You can also use convolutional neural networks to detect cancerous cells. Actually, there are some applications with convolutional neural networks that will recognize Chinese characters, which are very, very, you know, they're very quite difficult. There's also traffic sign recognition, and there's also face recognition as well. You can use convolutional neural networks to take a look at high dimensional data, whether or not it's images or anything high dimensional, and infer what kind of thing it is inside the image. Okay. So convolutional neural networks, uh, in a very broad sense, looks. This, so this is what the pipeline looks like, and the credit goes to Andre Kaparthi from Stanford. So basically, you have an image, and inside of it, you want to figure out what exactly is contained in this image. So what's happening here is that you take this image, and the reason why it's called convolutional is because you're going to take this image and perform a bunch of convolutions, or a bunch of filtering steps. So what will happen is that you use a bunch of different filters and different orientations, and each of these outputs will serve as an input into the input neuron. So what's happening here is that we're using 10 different filters to serve as 10 different input neurons. So each of these filters are different responses. And the hidden layers, what they're doing is they're doing exactly the same thing as the input layer. So they're taking the, the output from the hidden layer and doing more convolutions on it and more different filters. And eventually what's going to happen is that these convolutions will get to the very end with the output layer. What it will actually give you the probability that that particular object belongs to a certain class. So you have this input layer, you're doing a bunch of convolutions, the hidden layer is doing exactly the same thing. And finally, at the very end, it gives you what the probability would be for that particular class for that image. So in this case, it detects that it's an airplane with high probability. Okay? There's actually a really cool application by this guy who wanted to, uh, it's called um, detecting whether or not you took a good or bad selfie. It's actually really cool. They, they actually use convolutional neural networks for that. And what they do is they scan Twitter and a whole bunch of different uh, images, like about two or three million or so. And what they do is they build a training set where they take a look at the hashtags for each image and they took a look at whether or not there, were any, there was anything indicating that it was a good selfie or a bad selfie and they would use those as labels. And then it would train a convolutional neural network to detect whether or not you made a good or bad selfie. So it's actually a, it's actually a pretty cool. I'll put a, link on, I'll put a link on the website for more details. But uh, they use CNNs to, you give it an image and then it tells you whether or not you took a good or bad selfie. It's a, it's a pretty cool application. Okay, 
The next topic we have is what's known as independent components analysis. So the, what independent component analysis is, is supposing you have an audio signal that has a bunch of different voices that are mixed together in linear fashion. So what independent, component, what independent components analysis does is that it will try to decompose your mixed signal into a bunch of separate sources where if you were to add them all together, you get the original source back. So it's a good way to, for example, if you're listening to a music track, it's a good way to decompose the music track into bass, uh, guitar, drums, vocal. So it's a nice way to take a linearly mixed signal and decompose it into separate sources. So it's what's known as an unsupervised learning algorithm. So the goal is to determine a signal Y such that you take all these individual signals from X1 to Xn with some weights and when you add them all together, that's what you get. You get the original signal back. Uh, the next topic we have is what's no, okay, so memory, app, you know, many applications separating out audio tracks. They use it for stock price prediction. You can also use it for determining how ripe tomatoes are, for example. You would use independent components analysis to extract out the different shades of red. And depending on how many shades of red you have and the intensity of the shades of red, you naturally determine how ripe the tomatoes are, which is actually pretty cool. Okay? And there's also another cool topic, which is known as reinforcement learning. So with reinforcement learning, what we've seen so far in supervised learning is that when you have a bunch of trading data, each data has an expected unambiguous right output. So for a binary classification, this is the positive class, and for, you know, and this is the negative class. You know, these labels are, they serve as what is known as the unambiguous right answers. But if you want, you know, if you want to go to a practical problem, let's say, you know, there are certain scenarios where you can't apply this particular principle. So for example, let's say you've got a four-legged robot, and your job is to be able to train it so that it is able to walk. And it's, let's say it's a four-legged robot, okay? When you take a look at the theory that we've covered in class for supervised or unsupervised learning, there's no way you can directly apply what we've learned to get it to train a robot. So, you know, suppose we're trying to train a four-legged robot to learn how to walk. We don't know what the actual correct or positive actions would be, and we also don't know what the negative actions would be either. So we can't correctly quantify what exactly would be, you know, a positive class meaning that it's the correct step or a bad step. So we don't know what learning algorithm we could use to explicitly say that, you know, this is a good or bad action. So what reinforcement learning does is that instead of representing it as positive or negative, what you have is what's known as a reward function, where you give it a good reward if it does an action that you want, and a bad reward if it does something that's bad. So for example, you could have a reward where the robot is walking forward, and you could have a bad reward where it either falls over or walks backwards. And the job of the learning algorithm is to take these reward functions and infer a prediction model where over time, it'll choose the best actions that'll give you the best rewards. And that's how you train a four-legged robot, which is actually pretty nice. Okay, so I have got a couple more topics and then we're going to finish up. The next thing that we're going to cover is what's known as statistical learning. So a big part of machine learning is probability and statistical analysis, which I kind of glossed over because personally I hate statistics, but it's actually a big part of machine learning. So we cover this briefly, but not enough, especially Bayesian decision theory. So statistical learning is concerned with creating a prediction model using statistics and probability and what you're doing is that you have some sort of predefined domain for your features. And the goal is to infer a probability distribution, distribution that, that is defined by those features. So you use probability theory and all that stuff to create an accurate prediction model. So there's many areas of statistical learning you can consider. For example, there's what's known as naive Bayes. Naive Bayes is actually used in spam classification, believe it or not. And basically what you're assuming is that each of the features are independent from each other, so you're using the idea of independence and Bayes theorem to create a prediction model whether or not you have spam or non-spam. And then you also have what are known as Bayesian networks. So basically you represent different states of a system as a graph, inside, you know, nodes between a graph. And the goal is to figure out which of the states when you're traversing along this graph would give you the most likely outcome. So the goal is to determine, you know, it's determine the probabilities of a system taking on a state in, you know, inside. And then two more topics, we have what are known as ensemble learning. Ensemble learning is a very powerful mechanism. Basically, what we've done so far is that we've only taken a look at individual algorithms, so neural networks, support vector machines, logistic regression. But it might be a nice idea to take all of these and combine them into one super model to get a better, accurate model. So what you're going to do is you'll use multiple learning algorithms that may be separate. So you have logistic regression, you know, support vector machines. You know, have these, you know, have these all combined together and you'll have a model that is better performing than any of them, in, any of them uh, you know, separate. And that's what's known as ensemble learning. So some areas include what are known as bootstrap aggregating or bagging. So what this means is that you have a data set, let's say it's a very large data set, and what you do is you randomly sample 
uh, a few, you know, you randomly sample a subset of this data set and you do it, let's say, k times. So you have k different training sets that you're randomly sampling from this particular data set and you create a prediction model for each of these training sets. And then what you do is if you want to create, if you want to do a prediction or a regression, what you do is you take an input feature and you put it through each of these different classifiers and then you just average the output or figure out which one is the most frequently occurring label and that will be the final output. So that's what's known as uh, bootstrap aggregating. And then uh, it reduces variance in overfitting and it also, uh, it also has better performance. And then there's another topic which is called boosting, which takes very weak classifiers that uses very simple decision rules and you can combine them together in a nice little way to get a strong classifier. And last but not least, we have a very large topic, especially since uh, you know, um, Apple and Google are focusing on it right now. It's what's known as natural language processing. So you've seen this very often in lots of technologies, especially Siri when you take a look at iOS or voice recognition. Basically what natural language processing does is that it is the computer's way to understand human language as it is being spoken. So for example, it's the ability to, for computers to understand human speech as it is being spoken to a microphone or to Siri or whatever. So uh, a lot of the times it's not very straightforward because different languages have different colloquialisms, different slang, uh, regional dialects. So it's very hard to train a good model that'll take all these things into account to understand what you're actually talking about. But it's a pretty hot topic right now. So the ultimate goal basically would be to replace all programming languages with a language called human, where you talk to the computer, you tell it what you want, and it does it for you. That's the whole point of natural language processing is because you want the computer to understand what you want, and then it does something for you in the end. If you've watched any sci-fi movies, especially your Star Trek, for example, you have replicators. You tell it exactly what you want, and it does it for you. So that would actually, you know, that's the future, and hopefully we'll get to that point eventually, but that's, uh, that's all I wanted to say about that. So that's the course. Uh, next week we're going to do a final exam review, and then your exam's on the 26th. So uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>